Wow, what an intro. Okay, so now that I'm on the stage, uh, first of all, folks, we are uh, streaming live, also on our YouTube channel, that's Warsaw JS at YouTube. So uh, for our audience, uh, which is abroad or outside or wherever you are, welcome to Warsaw JS meetup number 110. And as you can hear and probably see, we have a very, very interesting and enthusiastic crowd uh, today who've all come to receive some very valuable information regarding JavaScript and JS. And do we love JS? And will we always continue to love JS? <laughs> Not so sure. I'm more sure than you are. Yes, this is one of the most enduring languages and language groups within the entire field of information technology, and I believe it will remain so. This is meetup number 110, and we are Warsaw JS. We are a community, not a group, of software developers and also uh, novices and professionals, and we meet each month to talk about our favorite programming, programming, programming language, which is... JS, right. We focus on sharing experiences from different JS fields, from web browsers to servers, dev tools, mobiles, smart TVs, microcontrollers, databases, video games, etc., etc. And as you can see, as I told you, this is a slightly different presentation. Let's go forward. Uh, we are more than just uh, the monthly meetups on the second Wednesday of every month. Uh, we also involve a lot of different activities. We have master classes, workshops, conferences, also blogs which we support in cooperation with you and collaboration. And we also are an incubator, which means we understand openness as helping new great ideas. So if you have a new idea and you want to try to foster it, we also would like to help and assist you in realizing your potential and your concepts as well. And of course, please join us on our Slack channel because the thing I think that is slacking lacking, is in fact our Slack channel. So please visit our Slack channel and engage with us. We would really appreciate that. And our mission, I'm going to read this in full. WarsawJS exists to support both professional and novice software developers within the IT community. We intend to accelerate the education process by sharing knowledge and experience. I'm going to pause there. Many people, when they go to school or they do whatever they do to get as much experience as they have, tend to keep the knowledge for themselves because this knowledge is valuable, because they can earn a lot of money, they can advance themselves in life. Our philosophy is that the more we have together, the stronger we are, and we tend to intend to accelerate also the process of development by sharing our information because together we are more powerful than we are individually, and that is the idea of community. Although our community was established in Warsaw, we are now inter... Uh, th this is largely thanks to our global network of members and sponsors. Warsaw JS is for everyone. Uh, we are proud to be able to provide a safe, friendly, and welcoming environment for all. Now, I'm going to pause this sentence there and just say, for all. When we say for all, we don't need to know who those all are, do we? So the, the, the idea is this. We ascribe to the Berlin Code of Conduct, which means that we agree to treat each other and to interact with mutual respect. That's the general idea. Respectfulness in the way we interact, respectfulness in the way we speak, respectfulness in the way we treat each other, hopefully not only within this space, but at least while we are here together. Does everyone agree that that is the way we should proceed? Let me see some hands. You can raise them higher, be proud of that, because that, with that approach, I think we have a chance of a more uh, equitable and a more reasonable living environment. It's just the way that makes it more comfortable for people to live and to exist and to thrive. I'm going to continue. It's for everyone. Uh, we are open to all levels of IT understanding. That means even for a moron like myself, no, I mean, you know, moron, maybe not. Okay, but close. Uh, I'm, I do not code. I do not program. However, I do have some idea of how this thing works. 
largely thanks to the fact that I've attended these meetups. So I'm paying attention to the latest developments and all areas of software development and paying very close attention indeed and asking questions. Of course, we're going to encourage you to interact with the speakers and also ask questions because it is only through asking questions that we learn. This is not the old model of school where the speaker speaks and we take notes. We learn together through interactive activity. Uh, we are open to all levels of IT understanding. Members who are new to the industry will have unlimited access to an extensive amount of practical experience and advice. And it is true. That advice and that expense, uh, uh, experience is extensive. You will see. Okay, so this is me. I am your MC for the evening. My name is Barry Stallone. Thank you very much. And while I'm speaking, I'm reminded to say to our speakers to try to remember to separate your words, to speak slowly and clearly, because I'm hearing myself speak a little bit too quickly, because it's the beginning and I want to get started. And I'm realizing that sometimes the message gets lost when we forget that we have a listening audience, not only in the room, also abroad. So thank you for your warm welcome. And in addition to myself, we have our esteemed, amazing team, which is Piotr Gentara, <laughs> Sasha Mihawowska, Ahmad Pire, Louisa Haas, and Maciek Machniewski. We love you. I hope you're out there. In addition to that, and here's where my paper and pen comes in, we have our volunteers whose last names do not happen to be listed on these slides. I was very irritated by that. And so, we have Mehdi Akbari, Give me a hand. Marina Doroshuk. Matea, oh boy, Vasilevska. Mm -hmm. Grzegorz Markowski. Ilian Tashev. Katarzyna, oh boy, Rebus. Mm -hmm. Dvudbek, oh boy, Yasuf Zoda. <laughs> and Lena Senkiewicz. These are our volunteers. And because they volunteer their time, uh, it's possible for us to get a lot more done. These are people who are dedicated and really just offer their help in order to make things run more smoothly. If you are interested in also volunteering to pitch in, because this is a community, we would certainly welcome your joining us. Having said that, where are we? We have a contest, as usual. How many people are here for the first time? Let me just see another show of hands. Welcome to all you first-timers. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Nice to see you, and we hope to see you back again soon. Uh, the contest looks like this. If sometime during the evening you get the inkling or you're feeling a little bit generous and you want to share something with us in the form of a five-minute lightning talk, we will reward you with a 100% discount for a one-year JetBrains license. Now, it doesn't have to be anything formal. You don't necessarily have to have any slides, although that would be helpful. Uh, it's just about presenting something for five minutes in front of this very welcoming and warm crowd. Very welcoming and warm crowd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, five minutes. Uh, and of course, that license, once you've done the talk, we can arrange for you to receive that if you speak with one of our volunteers. So we're encouraging you to participate. And if you have an idea for a talk, a topic which has not been presented prior to this day, please uh, scan our QR code here. This is where you can go to our website and contact us, and we can talk about how we can get your presentation before our community. Uh, always interested in hearing new people talk about new angles, new techniques, uh, new ideas new technologies, maybe technologies and applications that you yourselves are developing. Uh, interesting stuff, wonderful opportunity. People here are listening, and we're waiting for you. And now we need the biggest applause of all. Can you guys start clapping now? Let's do it. Our sponsors today are BEC, Financial Technologies. I don't hear you. Fresha and XFANG. 
These are our sponsors, and BEC was kind enough to host us today, as they always are very, very gracious and hospitable. It's very comfortable here. This is Ahmad, our managing director, or rather, director of marketing in the corner, constantly making me nervous with the camera. Give him a hand. And of course, our media partner, KMAG Magazine, yes? Yeah, give them a hand, that's right. It's one of the oldest and finest, fanciest kind of high quality, let's say, fashion, art, culture magazines in Poland. I'm proud to know some of the owners and also to have appeared in that magazine in my lifetime, so I'm thrilled. Uh, they're a great media partner and we appreciate having them. Okay, without further delay, our first speaker today is going to be Jakub Wonsowski. Where are you? Is that you? Give him a bigger hand. Come on, Jakub Wonsowski. And his topic is experimenting with bun. Come on to the stage, Jakub. And for you folks in the audience, please contact us. We have a Facebook page. We're also on warsawjs.com, and you can see us anytime. Yes, yes, this very moment. And you can also go back and see some of our previous talks and a lot of the topics that were presented because we have a huge repository there of uh, previous talks and presentations. So don't forget to go back and take a look at that as well. See you folks soon. 25 minutes each speaker will have, followed by more or less a five-minute question and answer period. Please be sure that your question is, in fact, a question. You understand what that means, yeah. Sometimes we have this idea that we want to make a statement and we want to make a comment on the presentation, and it's not quite the same as, uh, doesn't have the same effectiveness as an actual question. Of course, you may have a comment which supports your question. Just try to make sure that your question is well thought out, and we would really appreciate that too. Uh, anytime you're ready, sir, here's your clicker. Narada. I od czasu do czasu będę mówił po polsku, ale rzadko. Nice landscape, wow. Yes. Oh, we forgot about Radio IT. Well, some of you may remember that actually uh, I have a podcast called Radio IT. We appeared a couple of years ago and then we disappeared uh, post mid pandemic. It just so happens that we have relaunched and are about to come back to the interwebs with our reboot. So it'll be Radio IT, the reboot. And this will be in cooperation with BEC Poland. So we have some very interesting speakers who's come to share some tips about uh, Danish work culture and what BEC is doing to encourage and to share Danish work culture here in Poland. Very interesting talk. 
uh, very interesting character, and uh, we'll share more details about that later. So yes, look out for Radio IT coming next episode next week. We have uh, our presence on Facebook, on uh, Twitter, on all the social media channels. So uh, we'll have more information about that later. Are we ready? Yeah. Yakub von Skofti, everybody. Thank you very much. It's good to be here, and I'm here to talk a little bit about BANs. Uh, sorry, one BAN, which is a modern run runtime for JS devs, which is quite new. So I'm not sure if, mm, okay, n not, n <laughs> not the time for telling what is BAN, but <laughs> I will tell you about the agenda for this presentation. So I will tell you what BAN is. I will tell you what, can I, what did I build with Ban, and I will tell you what did I prepare to do it. And I will go through implementation process because I don't like to, you know, checking new solutions without practicing on them on like real life organisms. So I will try to show you something that I did build on top of Ban. So what is Ban? Based on Ban docs, mm, Ban is all in one runtime. So it's something like note but it's faster it's new and it comes with all tools that we usually use to build apps like builder compiler transpiler test runner and package manager so um, why they say it's cool because it's very fast and if you check the comparisons on at their docs it's actually really really fast Mm, it has all necessary dev tools out of the box, and it also has TypeScript mm, out of the, the box, which is great. And it's built as a drop-in replacement for Node, so it's backwards compatible, and you can run Node apps in BAN as well, and it has elegant APIs. So, what we are going to build in BAN? We are going to Build UI component generator with using uh, with help of GPT. So um, to make it happen, I'm gonna need some way to build React. I need some way to serve API endpoints, and I need some possibilities to serve static files as well as uploading images. So let's go to project setup. So Project setup is quite straightforward because we go like mm, with npm, npm init, but we have ban init here. So initializing new ban project. Okay, so I'm gonna because I'm gonna switch jump between presentation and code. So I think it's okay. I got okay. Code is here. So. Mm, when initializing new, okay, I'm gonna hide these directories because I will show you later everything, mm, ev ev everything, so yeah. First things first, so we have our package JSON initialized and TypeScript is here out of the box. So as you can see, nothing is changed, like, I mean, between typical node project, but we have also here, Ban lock, which is like something similar to yarn lock or package lock JSON, but it locks mm, dependencies mm, slightly different because if you install dependencies of of specific version, and if you want to install the same dependencies in other project, that they, they, they will be uh, won't be installed from the beginning, but they will be g mm, taken from cache, so it's quite good for saving space. Okay, so we got new project, and I will show you that um, what I mean by, um, by TypeScript that is out of the box. We can, for example, we have a file called compile me, and we can do compile me using ban. And TypeScript is being transpiled on the fly, which is very convenient. The same goes with with TSX because we can compile, transpile mm, TSX on the fly as well. Uh, yeah, uh, do you see? Ah, yeah, do you see it? Okay, so yeah, that's that's convenient. So we have our pro mm, project ready, and we can go 
to next step, which is server setup. So we need a server, we need to serve our, our front end somehow, which is not ready yet. So how does it look like? First thing is that we have our server file. So to serve server, BAN gives me a possibility to run it by using ban.serve and it accepts um, function called fetch which, uh, which accepts request and then we are ready to handle this request somehow. I'm not going into this API router which I created because we will go to it further. Yeah, we can set up a port and we are ready to work to host or serve some files. Okay, so server is ready. Let's go to building front end. Okay, so as you know, mm, I would like to have my front end mm, as React. So I prepared two files. I've got index, index HTML, which is typical, typical client side mm, rendered app convention to render my React app in a div, and I've got my index TSX. So as you can see, I'm not able to render mm, index TSX here, so I have to transpile it first from TSX to JS so the browser can understand what's happening her, here. So mm, to make it happen, BAM gives me such thing as builder. So I use, I created simple script which is build this, and I can pass my entry point, which is index.tsx, and I can specify out directory. So my transpiled JS goes straight here. So I'm able to run my, my React on the browser. Okay, so this is cool because I didn't need any webpack or, or any, any other bundler, which was quite easy to implement. Okay, so let's go. So yeah, this this I did show you. This is my version of client side rendering which I prepared, and now it's time to to serve our front end. So I use API of ban called ban file to do it. Let's come back to code, and yeah, we have where is my server? Yeah, we have my. Let's go to my API router, and I have my controllers to serve HTML, CSS, and JS. As you can see, I'm using BAN file to get my index HTML and return it to the client when somebody enters my, my home page. Okay, so this is ready. Mm, this is ready and front end should be, should be ready to, 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 okay, let's, yeah, I'm just, I prepared it <laughs> before because, you know, live demos are, <laughs> are risky. So it's working, trust me, it's working. We can check on source that, that everything is working here for now. So, okay, we've got our front end ready. Let's move to infra setup. So now I'm gonna mm, set up my SQLite database. So, which is quite, it was quite easy to do it with BAN because they have some, they have one SQLite module and I created a new database with simple, mm, simple query to create new table and simple query to insert dummy record to, to my database. Okay, so database is ready because it's being initialized just above my server so we can go further. Let's go to integrating OpenAI API. So this is quite easy because it was just about initializing API, OpenAI client and passing API key, which I did, which I did by using ban.env. So it, it's another cool feature of ban that I don't need that env. I just can use my environment variables by calling ban.env. Okay, everything. Everything, everything is almost ready, but another last thing that I will need is to make my mm, assets bucket accessible from the internet because I'm going to send images that I upload and I didn't want to use some third party providers and 
some file storage. So it, it's just a prototype, it's just, it's just a proof of concept, so I wanted to make it as fast as possible. So this works, <laughs> we, we, will, we will see if it works, I will just check, it should work, we will see. Mm, okay, so let's come to the main part, so generating components. So first thing is to upload image. So let's, I will show you how it looks in, 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 in my form because I just want to show you that I'm calling one endpoint that I created. So I'm, I'm sending one image and I'm calling one endpoint that I created. So this endpoint is of course here which is generate new component. This is my controller and here I have my, my controller where I check if my uploaded image is valid type and I have my service logic here. So I do upload my image using BAN write, which is another part of BAN's API which is quite really understandable. Another thing is that I generate that component I think it's another slide, so I will go to be synchronized, yeah. Then I call GPT and save um, returned endpoint, so I pass my uh, tunnel to localhost origin here, so GPT can access it. Um, here is like a simple prompt, um, a lot of TS errors, so let's don't look at it. <laughs> at it. Mm, another thing is that I save my component locally using ban write as well. And last thing is that I'm saving it to database. So I'm doing it like right here and I'm running simple query to insert my component to my SQL database. So, mm, so the result, let's try if that works. Mm, I'm gonna try and for example do a screenshot of it and let's generate component based on uh, of course okay let's of course last last try I'm checking, ah, because I don't have an internet, okay. Internet, I'm, <laughs> yeah, so, almost, almost, because, okay. Um, okay, so now let's try if, let's try again, let's do a screenshot. Okay, maybe some, Let's do it here. Okay, so let's check what's gonna be generated. So I think, okay, I think it looks like it's working. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we have a button and it's pretty <laughs> similar. <laughs> uh, yeah, so my component was, mm, was saved here in generated components as a React component so I can <laughs> so yeah, it saves a lot of time. So I think I think that's that's cool. And yeah, let's come back to the presentation so it works. My thoughts on the process is that BAN is great for prototyping because it was really, really fast to have everything like, you know, out of the box. I didn't have to think about bundlers, transpilers, servers because I had everything. Mm, but I think it's still, it still needs more abstraction for, for bigger projects. So even if I would like to do bigger projects on top of, on top of BAN, I, would d I wouldn't have any benefits from that because, for example, Next.js or Remix uses Node for, for, up, up for API routing, so BAN would be beneficial only as a package manager. So I think it's it's not enough for now. And there are not so many options to deploy right now. So it's like Docker is the fastest way to do it. And I think, I think yeah, th that's all. So I don't think that any big player will like rush into implementing that in production, big production projects, but we will see. 
especially that the ban is, is motivating Node and Deno to move forward with convenient and mm, cool features. So yeah, if you want to try it by yourself, I prepared interactive workshop on Nerdboard. Mm, you can try it by yourself. Uh, you will get through some tasks that, that I prepared and you will be code reviewed by AI and in t you will implement server-side rendering and client-side rendering using BAN. So if you're interested to get your hands on it, I'm totally recommending you to do. So yeah, thank you very much. I'm here for you and <laughs> <coughs> Yep. Bravo, 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 Jakub, 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 and on time as well. I was prepared for this to be at least 25 minutes long. I was looking forward to using uh, our favorite gong over here. Are you familiar with this? Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those of you yeah. who go over time. I'm scared of it. When yeah, this is waiting right. for you. Uh, bun, all the APIs you need all baked into one. Yeah, I love that expression. Anyone have any questions for Jakub? Uh, I have one short question. Uh, can we see your prompt? Of course. Ooh. 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 <laughs> Private, serious business there. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> no, because you know, I'm, I'm going to work on it a little bit. So it's quite easy and you can try it with GPT-4, but to be honest, I would like to not share it because I want to expand my proof of concept into some tool. I totally understand. You know, you, you. Jakub, I don't blame you. This prompting area is very private, is it not? I mean, what a question. I mean, I don't blame you for trying. Thanks for understanding. <laughs> That's right. Can I see your Thanks. prompt? Ooh, I'm in the process right now of peer prompting. Has anyone tried peer prompting? Peer prompting with someone else? Oh, go for it. Next question. Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks. I wanted to ask, um, so from my understanding, Ban is a great tool to do prototyping, like small projects, test some concepts. But is there any benefit for bigger projects, like, produ uh, like I don't know, like pr uh, optimization-wise or performance-wise or um, uh, I don't know, some, something bigger than just prototyping. Thanks. I think like using BAN as a package manager would be beneficial in bigger projects when sometimes you wait on CI like many minutes for dependencies to be installed. So I see an area of optimizi optimization here. And yeah, it, you can also run mm, lower uh, like lower code, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> like low, lower level code functions like C, C++. So if you have an expertise on that and you know how to use that to optimize like your your app, it, it can be beneficial. But then if you use that, you won't be able to, probably you won't be able to run your project because it will use this BAN API which is not available in Node, so I see only a benefit. Project or commercial project do it's you plan to? It's a hobby project for now. So but it is it open source or closed source? Maybe it will be open source. It's like I made it to just, I, I just made it for, for, for this presentation, so I will, I think that Making uh, it uh, like open source would, would okay. be uh, interesting. <laughs> yes. Another question: Can you imagine Microsoft Paint being a viable programming environment uh, as a replacement for Visual Studio Code? We are going this way, <laughs> so it, it can happen. Like Paint is going to be king <laughs> again, <laughs> <laughs> or Figma, probably. Can you repeat that question again? I didn't understand that. Uh, because uh, using Microsoft Paint as a like environment uh, for programming. Yeah, you can use Paint for programming for creating components. They added layers to Paint. Hmm. Sorry. They added layers to Paint. Like layers. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. I think ah, you are I, ready I for know. one more question. <laughs> it's like, it's you mean like in Paint? They add. Ah, okay. I, 
I didn't know that. Yes, sir. Uh, hello. Okay. Uh, if I understand correctly, you are sending uh, the request to OpenAI and receive the, in response the React component. Can you show the prompt? How do you do it? <laughs> but, the <coughs> <coughs> but the prompt of... Oh. <coughs> it's like, I can show you on... So because because basically yeah because basically you can run I will show you because it's mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> They're relentless. They really need to see the inside of this process. What was it that you prompted? Yeah, something like that and then you can play with it so this approach saved me Everyone, really? tons of time, so. <laughs> was, that an, was that a good answer? Did, did it answer your question? Super. One more question. Are you ready, Piotr? Uh, so with that app, you've proven that front-end engineers are obsolete. Uh, what's the next step? Yeah, what is the next step? Software engineering as a full-stack developers, because I don't believe in a splitting developers be, between front-end developers and back-end developers now when AI is, is happening. Okay, nice, <laughs> nice component. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I, I believe that we'll need more, more different skills than before. So, you know, doing components is going to be automatized very soon and we will need to know how to connect everything with each other and we will have to know how to work with each other as a engineers. So I don't believe in front-end development, I believe in software engineering. Uh, Jakub, thank you very, very much. If you have more, yeah, yeah, give him applause. If any of you out there also uh, on Twitter or on our Warsaw JS uh, uh, channel have any other questions for Jakub, please don't hesitate to submit your questions and we'll try to make sure that they get answered. Uh, in the meantime, he's gonna be here a little bit later also, so if you guys want to ask more questions or have more conversation on the topic of BUN, this application, uh, please you know, engage with him during the networking session. Our next speaker, whom I can't wait for, only because the topic, the name of the topic sounds so exciting, this hybrid revolution. Uh, yeah, also, getting back to what we were talking about, this idea of splitting between front-end and back-end developers, I always found that kind of uh, perplexing. Uh, and I thought that, from my point of view, because I'm a non-programmer, this is very, I want to say, yeah, it's nice to have a specialty, and at the same time, now that we have you know, a lot of different artificially intelligent tools. I'm seeing ways in which we can expand uh, and be able to delve into different areas of software development um, even quite easily. It's, a, it's sort of encouraging to see that people are thinking beyond those previous borders and parameters and thinking about being more well-rounded developers. Okay, having said that, uh, please welcome to the stage Alexander Lubitsch. Thank you. Thank and his you. topic is hybrid revolution. I ah. love it. I love the ex expression. Just love it. Can't wait. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay, one second. Okay. How many of you heard about hybrid applications? Please raise a hand. What? That little? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How many of you worked with hybrid applications? I guess not that many, okay. And how many of you are using hybrid apps each day? Uh, this is a tricky question. Uh, I guess everyone can raise a hand. So if we look on the US apps market, we can see that 74% uh, of hybrid apl applications in general are, are hybrid. 
And additionally, if we look on the developers, we can see that we have 30, oh, thank you, that would be much easier. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we have 30 times more web developers than native developers. So if we look on the big tech companies, we can see that most of them have some hybrid app available in App Store. So that brings me to the topic of my presentation, which is hybrid revolution. So the revolution that is happening in our industry, the revolution that brings the best from web and native, the revolution that happened here in BC. My name is Alexander Lubeck, and I'm front-end developer in BC. I work with micro front-end platforms for a couple of years now. Uh, recently, I became a dad, and I'm pretty hyped about that. I love to play guitar with my band, and I'm doing some game development. Yeah, I'm totally noobish, but yeah, trying my first steps. Today, I'll talk about how we in BEC navigated through the hybrid revolution, what was the implementation journey for us, and what is the outcome of this implementation. What is hybrid app? So to understand what the hybrid app is, let's look firstly on the native application. So native application is an app which runs on the native code. In case of Android, it is Java or Kotlin. In case of iOS, it's Objective-C or Swift. Swift, thank you. <laughs> so if we look on the web app, we have HTML, CSS, JavaScript, as you all know. Right? Usually it runs in browser. So if we combine those two words, we have hybrid application. So it's a web code that runs in the native container. But you as the front-end developers, oh, sorry, for front-end, but generally for as a developers, uh, you're probably thinking, why? Why you should bother with hybrid application, right? And this is a valid question, especially from developer perspective. So to answer that, let's look on the hybrid applications from the business perspective. And if you do so, you can see that hybrid apps can bring you a lot of good stuff. For example, you can have efficiency in development. You can develop code once and deploy that to all platforms. Additionally, having code built once you can have the UI consistency between different platforms. And if you have this code once, you can deploy fast to all platforms. And for us, there was additional thing which was very important, and it was being open for co-creation, so for third parties. So having that in mind, we started our journey with hybrid application. And just before we started the implementation, we asked a couple of questions, which basically we were able to put in the decision tree. So we start the first with the first question, which is, what are our users? So basically, do we have primary mobile users, or do we have mixed users? And for us, answer was mixed. So that basically tell us that we should go a bit in the other direction. But the next question was, do we need to support the existing web code? So basically the code that we had written in JavaScript. And for us the answer was yes. The last question was, do we need to support the native features? And again the answer was yes. So we end up with the hybrid framework that we need to implement. And just to highlight, I want to show you what were the technical drivers for us. And the technical drivers was existing web that is running in the native application and native feature support that we need to have in those applications. And the native feature support we wanted to have to bring the native feeling to the web applications that are run in 
um, native app. So we started our journey, and the first step was going from monolith to micro front end setup. So we had NX and Angular, classical application, Angular, and we divided our application to several micro front ends, native shell and web shell, and we added the module federation to that to be able to run these micro front ends. So because of that, we could run our native shell in native application and web shell in browser running the same micro front ends. The next step was looking on our features and finding the features that we want to elevate to bring this you know, native feeling to the users. So for example, here we have alert service, which we basically re rewrite from web-specific implementation to abstract layer. So having that, we could have two different implementations, one for web, a second for native. And that's awesome, because having that, we could introduce the secret sauce. So the glue that is connecting everything together in the native application. And for us, that was Ionic. So we have three steps that we did. Do you think that was enough? Any other an answers? Yeah. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> the answer is uh, partially. <laughs> so if it comes to the new micro front ends, we were able to run them in both uh, native and web, uh, giving the user you know, this native feeling. But if it comes to the existing code, we had a tiny problem with it. And this problem we call circular dependencies. So in our project, we had a lot of things that were connected together and should not be connected. So we started to looking in, on that, and we created additional layers and moved different pieces around to be able to decouple things. And if you are interested in that, please check out this talk by my colleague who is sitting here, Jacob. <laughs> Awesome talk, how we went through this very complicated process of the couple of things. So great, it seems like we have everything covered. So we have pretty simple setup, Angular, right? Everyone knows Angular, it's just another front-end framework. We have Ionic, okay, some other fr framework to talk with native application. Model Federation, NX Monorepo, Micro Frontends. Yeah, it's not that simple anymore. So some of our consultants were not sure that it will work, you know? And others just have no idea what's going on. Uh, by the way, this is Chichu, our office pet. Yeah. So we have pretty complicated setup, but the question is, did we deliver our business goal? Let's look. So do we have efficiency in development? Yes, we can build once point X because we still need some native development, you know, for this awesome feeling for developers, uh, for users. And we can deploy that to all platforms. Do we have cross-platform consistency? Yes, we have unified design system together with the same code that is run everywhere. So we have, we have it, basically. So do we have fast updates? Not really. This is the one thing that was missing, because having this complex system brought us a bit more complicated release process. And uh, things need to be, let's say, done a bit slower if it comes to release. But we are open for third-party integration. So we get almost everything, and we're still in progress on these fast updates. So I want to look now on the outcome of this implementation. What does it mean for our organization? And I'm talking about this specific implementation. So if you look on this decision tree, 
that I presented a couple of minutes ago, you can see that if you go with one direction, you are willing to sacrifice some things. So basically, if you are not going with PWA, you are willing to sacrifice the cheapest implementation that it is, the limited skills that you need to have because you have only front-end developers, and the simplest deployment that you can have. If it comes to fully native implementation, the most important thing is highest performance that you can have, the platform support that you have right away, because with hybrid framework, you might have some delays with new features. Okay, those are the trade-offs. But I also want to point out, let's call them development lifecycle headaches. And those are basically the challenges that we currently have. And the first one is testing. So the, the testing became much more complicated for us. Because we need to test both platforms, our testers are more involved than ever, basically. So we have also more problems with debugging if it comes to developers, because the, if the bug is only on native platform, then we need additional effort to debug that. And if it comes to developers, they need to understand how the platform works. They don't need to know the implementation of the platform, but they need to know that there are some features that are supported only in native to bring this you know, native feeling. So it, this is additional layer of knowledge for them. And there is one last thing which, which is called cars of knowledge. So cars of knowledge is a situation when you have people which build the platform and they understand that well, and they know that well. So for them, it's obvious how it works. So they, for example, talking to some other developer and trying to explain something, and they are very, let's say, not angry, but they are like, okay, why didn't you get it? It's so simple. We have very simple setup, right? So those are the life cycle development development lifecycle headaches that we have. But from all of that that I said, I just want one thing for you to remember. Less is more. Build once, use everywhere. And if you start working with the hybrid app, and probably you will, just find the right spot for it. Thank you. <coughs> so, before, before the questions, I have one question that I want to ask. Is it okay? Yes, of course. Great. So, <laughs> You're the question ask this is question to everyone or to all of us? For, for everyone, for everyone. So the question is, it's more about the implementation, more technical, but why we had to introduce two shells, one for native and one for web? Do okay. you have any ideas? Looking for best answer. Best answer. Well, hold on. We need to hear this online and around the world. Uh, I thought about like screen size and differences between using a mouse and a touch screen. So but again, again, screen size, but yes. screen, 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 yeah, screen size, uh, and, and what? Input differences, like on mobile you have touch screen, but uh, sorry, uh, but if you're browsing from the web, like from your PC use keyboard and mouse, so that also might be a difference. That was okay. Answer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Next possible answer, let's go to the next. I think your main problem was the difference in environments. So for example, you have window for the web environment and like in, for, a, for example, in React Native, you want to use a sync storage or some other things which are not uh, available in the web environment, obviously, so to share no, to split the functionality which is available for specific platform, you need to have, like you called, two different shells. Implementations. Mm -hmm. One more time. One more, yeah, one yeah, more we have. Here we go. Yeah, almost the same. Like, uh, you need to implement those abstractions that you show us uh, for different platforms, for web and for mobile, for example, like usage of. Uh, I don't know, geo services or something. So you mm -hmm. need to implement this. You can implement this in the in inside the shell. Okay. Do we have any other answers? 
It's not someone from VC, yeah, right? One more. Okay, <laughs> you would be on the other end of the football field. Here we go. Uh, any good ones sounding good so far? I don't know. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, I think you wanted to feel native. Yes, uh, but just what are the technical reasons? Uh, uh, say it again? Technical reasons for that. Oh, uh, I got it. Maybe some uh, platform dependent uh, libraries were used. Okay. Okay, so is that enough? Possible answers, yes. Please tell us what the best answer was. Yeah, so the best answer is uh, with the implementation. So you, you want to narrow the amount of JS files, right? You want to have different implementations, the first one, and narrow the amount of JS files that you bundle to the application. This is the first answer. But the next answer that I am surprised that no, no one answered that is that if you have the shell, like if you have the native application, the shell, it's basically does not need the UI at all, because the UI is given f from the uh, native application. And in web, you need to have the uh, UI, because you, ha you, you need to have the he header, you need to have you know, side box and everything. This is the part of that shell is responsible for. But in native, you are loading only micro frontends, which does not need you know, the, the upper bar or whatever. So it is empty. And the, the most important thing is, of course, the different implementations. So you want to have specific implementation, specific you know, library for this native implementation, and of course, narrow the bundle size. So thank you very much for answers. Oh, uh, well, to be fair, uh, from the yeah, beginning. Yeah, one second, one second, one second. Sure. I to be fair, from the beginning, your question was, it's how many of us I'm are sorry, using I'm hybrid sorry, applications? And uh, oh, and prizes. Yes, we have prizes. So uh, who gave this? Uh, this was first answer. Yes, I agree. yes, yes. But we have we had also and one more sitting right there. In okay, the we'll find something for you. So. Uh, thank you very much. That was interesting. It's always nerve wracking when the when the speaker asks a question and asks for the best answer. To be fair, from the beginning, the question was, how many of you are using hybrid applications on a regular basis? And there were very few hands that went up. So I'm not surprised that the answer to your question was difficult for our audience today. Does anyone have any other questions for Alexander? So I have quite a similar experience, the same NX for like managing applications, the uh, React application for the web and like React Native. So and for sharing code base, we use the framework which called Native Base which basically is responsible for splitting, uh, for, for pre providing the same components for the web and mobile. Mm -hmm. And I would say in the end, uh, like the design for the mobile application, which is application was so much different from the mobile view of the web application that uh, I would say for, for the most of people, uh, makes sense mostly to split, to, to split the logic. So uh, my question probably was how, uh, how good uh, you was able to share the, the view between different pl platforms sure, and sure. how much it was different. So because we build this bridge uh, which exposes the same let's say global functionalities that we wanted to elevate to you know, this native level, so give the user native feeling, we basically can run the whole micro front end, so the same feature in native application. So actually we are trying to aim to the point where micro front ends are agnostic and they don't know in which platform they, they run. If they need to you know, have some unique native feeling uh, feature, for example, uh, we have swipe to refresh, which is very native specific, so it's only on native. Then it's, it is all, all also available in the bridge, but uh, microfrontends needs to basically create the logic specifically for that feature. So from, from our point of view, it is in entire domain like microfrontend that is running in the, in the native. So, and, uh, and actually it, it works pretty well. It looks pretty well. Um, I'd like to ask you a question. How much native code do you need to write in this uh, implementation in your um, Ionic um, implementation? Thanks. 
Um, this is a good question. Uh, I'm not a native developer, so I did not implement it, those things. Uh, but we have both uh, for and developers for Android and for iOS. So there is some layer of, uh, you know, implementation on the sides of uh, native part. But comparing to, you know, to the feature that needs to be r written from the beginning, you know, like from scratch, it's, it's not much, basically. Okay, so you have another yep. question. I'm sorry, I already have the microphone. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> ah, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, with the latest uh, evolution, I would say of the web platform, would you say that there is a possibility that you would be able to replace your hybrid apps with fully web apps like PVAs and other things? I'll give you a good example. For, uh, previously, real-time video processing was not possible with JavaScript alone, but now we have stuff like Web Codex API, which exposes basically native hardware accelerated video processing. Do you think that will be feasible in the future to replace it based on how cheap it is to hire JavaScript developers? Uh, it's a, actually, this is Easy, a great a great question. This is a great question. The, the problem with hybrid application is that I think that we need to remember the limitations, you know? For example, you still have some, like I said, performance issue. So if, for example, for gaming, you will not be building, you know, hybrid application, right? So I if we are on the same level with some new features, if it comes to performance, then there is no need to go native, right? We can build that from hybrid, basically, in web technology. So, yeah, I, thi I think we have, we, we might come to the play, uh, like, let's say, point where we have the same performance and there is no need to go, you know, fully native. Okay, we'll have two more questions, and then we're going to be taking a break. Uh, here's your next question, sir, Alexander. Thank you. So, uh, after a presentation, I got that your idea was to support some uh, native applications. And uh, I saw uh, different considerations on how to do it, different decision trees, and uh, a lot of uh, time spent on uh, application decomposition. And my question, like, uh, why haven't you considered some approaches to entirely rewrite your application, for instance, using Flutter, which already supports web, Mac OS, Linux, Windows, iOS, and Android, and solve all your questions? Yeah, sure, sure. This is a good question, but not entirely, because I pointed out that our main like we had two technical drivers, and one of them is to be able to run existing code, so the existing feature. Basically, we had huge existing code in Angular that we wanted to run in native application, and there was, there was no possibility to just rewrite it because we did not have the resources for that. We had resources to build some you know, platform that we can then you know, extend to next level, for example, for third parties, which we are focusing right now. But we could not go fully flatter be because we had still support Angular with, you know, the existing web code. Uh, so hi here. Um, <clears throat> my question is about uh, one of the features that makes the native platform feeling native. Actually, where, where we were working with this hybrid application, um, is the main problem with the w how the web history and navigation and transitions work. So my question is how you deal it with, with that you are saying that your app is, has those native feeling. Yes. For example, if it comes to native feeling, like I, like I mentioned before, we have something like swipe to refresh. So those are the features that are all only available in the net, uh, I mean, in the native application. We don't have uh, like animations during the uh, during uh, the root change, for example. Those are the Angular animations, so they are very let's say they are aligned with the uh, animations that are in the native application, but it's not the same. But we, for example, uh, introduce some uh, loaders, for example, native loaders, so you can con control the loader from inside the web code to like notify the native part that okay, show the loader. And when we finish, please hide it. So, like for user, you, you, they, they 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 see only the web code, like the feature, the web code, and then you know if they are controlling the the, 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 the like the view is controlling the loader that brings this you know this native feeling. So for user, it's very hard to you know 
to see that it's not native. And we are trying to find you know, those, those features that can bring this native feeling as much as possible, right? So the future is hybrid. Is that what we're saying? Definitely. <laughs> uh, folks, give another big hand to Alexander <laughs> Lubicz from BEC Poland. Uh, great uh, presentation. Tons and tons of questions concerning this topic, I promised you. Uh, I hope he'll be available during the break. We're about to take a 20-minute break before we come back with our third talk. Is that okay with everyone? All right, see you when we get back. Thank you very much.
pinch minute. Five minutes, everybody. And please, zaprashame spovrotem. Come back. Chiminutki, three minutes, everybody. Please, Inv can we invite you back to your seats? Three minutes. Three. So I'm sensing that it's going to take more than three minutes for us to settle down. So I'm just going to start talking and remind people that we will be continuing our live stream in about three minutes. Zaprashames povrotem. Come closer. I've got cookies. You better deliver on that promise. <laughs> Not the ones you thought, but yeah, there's ah. cookies involved. Okay. All right, it's happening slowly. Two minutes, two minutes. Okay, maybe this will catch your attention. I'm gonna plug in my clicker, so. Please also remember that we are streaming live, so any background noise is going to possibly interfere with our transmission. So, 
we're going to need more quiet in the room. Yeah. Okay, we have Bluetooth, anyone? Uh, hang on, hang on. Just I'm not starting yet, I'm just setting up. Uh, it's just, if anyone likes web Bluetooth, uh, this is what I'm doing. I'm pairing with my clicker, and my clicker runs JavaScript to flip through slides. Just saying. <laughs> Under the hood. <laughs> yeah, it's all JavaScript. That's the good news, that's the good news. All right, it is considerably quieter in the room. Even I am surprised. So, how are we liking the talk so far this evening? Good, right? Yeah. Happy to hear that your energy is still high, and I've been promised by our next speaker that the energy will be even higher uh, during this talk. He's a very energetic speaker, not speaking for the first time. And in just a moment, give me please 60 seconds, we will start. I lost count. Um, okay, that's 60 seconds, I hope. No, it's not. <laughs> Come closer. Okay, so, uh, welcome back, folks. Zbyszek Tenderowicz is our next speaker. And what is the topic of your talk, Zbyszek? Uh, it's JavaScript hacking as usual. JavaScript <laughs> hacking as usual. Is that the title? Yeah. No, I'm running code from the internet. Running code from the internet. Please welcome Zbyszek to the stage. Okay, okay. Yeah, so we're hacking. So I should be wearing my hoodie the right way, like a hacker, right? Is that correct? Uh, okay. I'm running code from the internet, and so do you. Uh, sorry, getting ahead of myself. So, who am I? Uh, I've been dealing with JavaScript for a while. Uh, I've been organizing and speaking at Meet.js for like, okay, uh, 13 years or so. Uh, and I'm working on a project called Lavamote, that's the next logo. Uh, and that project is sponsored by MetaMask, the, the crypto wallet. I barely know anything about crypto, but I do know some things about JavaScript security, and they find it necessary, you know? Uh, and this is my website URL. Uh, you can go there, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Uh, but first, um, there's this survey I tend to do. Okay, this is too silly. Um, there's this survey I tend to do uh, where I ask, would you accept a string of text? Like, just, just any string of text. And I promise you it's JavaScript. Uh, would you put it in your application in production and just, just run it with your customers without reading what I gave you? Would you do that? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, that's good results. Um, so would it help if I offered to put it in a targz file before giving it to you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so, uh, because that's what NPM packages are. And don't get me wrong, they're glorious, I love them. Um, but um, they're also unsanitized input uh, from people in the internet uh, that you put in your applications and run, aren't they? Um, okay, so what we're doing on a daily basis is like consuming all of those packages. And, and I do that all the time, and you do that all the time. Uh, but what if some of them are not actually that great. And I don't mean lousy packages. I published a bunch of lousy packages and nothing happened. Uh, but what if they're actually malicious? What if they want to do bad things to your application or your users, right? Um, how would we even know? Oh, well, I'm assuming we just wouldn't. Uh, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. So uh, this is a topic of supply chain security. And I've been uh, dealing with that for a while. So it started with uh, me noticing those dependencies, they could be vulnerable. Uh, that was in like 2015 or something. Um, and 
you know, there, there were some projects uh, like before NPM audit, but mostly NPM audit that helped with that. Uh, I started working on getting my team to adopt it. Uh, there's a big story about it. So I produced this package and gave a bunch of talks about it. Uh, then I looked at malicious install scripts uh, with some fun side effects. Uh, then I moved on to hardened JavaScript and lava mode. We're going to get there. Uh, but there's also uh, a bunch of talks about it on my website. Um, and then defensive coding and prototype pollution. That, that was also fun. Uh, you should check it out. I run workshops on DEF CON and NodeCon for you about that thing. Uh, they were not recorded, but you can find them on my GitHub, and they are almost self-explanatory. Feel free to get in touch. Uh, OK, and then I went to some uh, events to show running malware live on my machine, uh, malware straight from NPM. Uh, I might be able to squeeze that in today. Uh, so all of that available at Nautor PL. Let's get back to the main topic. OK, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, what could happen around your dependencies if they turn malicious, OK? So it's going to be a story. Uh, let's meet our protagonist. Uh, that's a random developer. Uh, and he decides to install some dependencies. But unbeknownst to him, there's a hacker lurking, offering a package somewhere in the dependencies. Like, you won't even notice, but there's a bad package somewhere in there, OK? Um, so the developer thinks, now I'm not running that. I only execute code from the packages I know, right? Wrong. There's post install scripts. So whatever is in the post install scripts, it's going to run when you install the package. Even if you don't use that package, even if you're not aware of that package, it's buried somewhere in your dev dependencies, it's going to run the post install script as you, the user, running npm install. OK, so that's how the hacker gets in. All right, so wait, if I do npm install, in a Docker container, uh, and then just copy the node modules folder away and destroy the container. Ha, solution, right? Wrong. Uh, OK, so this is a throwback to one of the talks I gave. If you want to see the demo, find a recording. I'm going to walk you through what happened. Uh, uh, I created a package that would uh, run the post install script that finds TypeScript next to it in node modules, and then modifies the compiled JS of TypeScript compiler to add malicious code to the application it's building. That was fun. Uh, and it worked. So OK, you can turn off all the scripts, right? Uh, but then some of those scripts are there for a reason. Uh, some of your dependencies need to build something. Uh, what do we do then? We do npm rebuild and name of the package, like bcrypt. bcrypt needs to compile itself. All right. So did you know there can be more than one package called bcrypt in your dependencies? And this is not about versions. Um, so our lovely hacker decides to uh, put a bundled dependency in the malicious package. So the malicious package can be named whatever, but the bundled dependency that ships inside of the targz file is named bcrypt. So now, when we run uh, npm rebuild bcrypt, we're going to rebuild both. Fun. Yeah. OK, what now? Uh, so yeah, that's when our protagonist finds lava mode. And that's why I'm telling you the story. Uh, OK, so the first, like, uh, the entry to using lava mode is allow scripts. Uh, it's a tiny little tool uh, that when you, when you set it up, uh, you're in control of which packages are allowed to run their post install scripts. Okay? If you want to follow or click any of the links, it's, it's already on my website, by the way. You can just click in, into it. Um, yeah, so. When you run the tool, uh, in your package JSON, there's a section where you can decide which of the scripts uh, should actually run. They're all off by default, and they're identified in a way that you will not get confused by a package of the same name that's not actually the same package. 
Okay. For added convenience, you can now run any sort of npm install, uh, and after that, run allow scripts uh, to get the result you're expecting uh, with only the right scripts running. Okay, everything else is turned off. We generate the configuration for that. Okay, so at that point, your installation process is safe, right? Well, there's more to JavaScript development than installation. Uh, so yeah, now our hacker emails someone, like one of the more famous NPM contributors maybe, uh, hey, author of this package, I can see you're tired of maintaining it. Can I take over? Can I help? Uh, that's, that thing actually happened. Um, yeah. So then, when the hacker takes over a package that people actually use, um, the code for that package could suddenly start running this. What's this? When you run your build in your CI or if you run your tests somewhere, uh, it's going to grab your GitHub token and send it somewhere. Is that good? No? Okay. Would you go and read your NPM uh, modules in your node modules folder? Well, in case you did, okay, uh, this is a bit less readable. Uh, but you can still see GitHub token in there, so yeah, let's let's keep going. <laughs> this is a tiny bit of screenshot from the actual full version of the original code with full obfuscation. It's now 60 kilobytes, uh, but you're not gonna read it. All right, so what now? Well, there's an app for that. Uh, yeah, so Lavamote, the, the main feature of Lavamote is protection at runtime. If this sounds un unbelievable, it is. I wouldn't believe it two years ago, uh, but then I joined the team and learned how it's possible. It's crazy. Um, okay, so first what you do is you generate the policy for your application, and it creates a policy file. I'll explain it in a moment. And then with that policy file, uh, you can decide which package gets to access which globals and which built-ins and which other packages. So you're in control of every powerful API every single dependency of yours could reach. Okay, and then you run it, like instead of node build.js, you run lava mode build.js and it runs with the protections provided by lava mode. So if a package all of a sudden, starts reading process env and reaching for fetch, these two are going to be undefined because that package didn't use them before and that's not in your policy. Um, yeah, so this is a tiny fragment of what the policy file could look like. So when we generate the policy file initially, uh, some, some code reads your code and generates this, but you get to decide that you're not gonna give them the access. And this package, even if we didn't detect it, these are false by default. So this package would not have access to HTTPS uh, import and to the global named process. And this happens within one process, within one thread, within one context in Node.js and in the browser, by the way. Uh, okay, so now when we run build with the malicious package that already got in, we're going to get one of the two errors. Uh, it's gonna either say uh, the allow list would not allow evil package to get HTTPS, or it will tell you that uh, someone tried to read env from undefined. Remember, process.env? Yeah, process is suddenly undefined, but only for this package, not for a package that you agreed to use the process reference. Okay, how? Um, yeah, this is not supposed to be happening in JavaScript, but it is, so what's inside? Um, and this is going to be a very brief explanation of what's inside, and like a very top level one. Um, so inside is what we call hardened JavaScript or secure ECMAScript. Uh, Sess, in short, uh, it's, it's a package. You can also use it. Um, but what it gives us is we can put each of your dependencies 
in a separate compartment, that's what we call the box uh, in which we isolate uh, JavaScript. Uh, and we can decide what the global reference for that compartment is going to be. Uh, and this is becoming part of the JavaScript language itself, potentially, eventually. Um, so there's some nice people in TC39 working on a proposal to get compartments uh, into JavaScript. There's a bunch of layers that need to happen first. So, you know, module loading, virtualization, and stuff like that. Like, sounds difficult. Well, try reading TC39 proposals. Um, but uh, yeah, this is, this is moving forward. Uh, if I'm optimistic, I, I can tell you it's gonna be there in a year, probably longer. Uh, not guaranteed, but doing our best. Um, and what are the ingredients of the solution? So we have compartment, it's a constructor of this box uh, that can accept code, accept the definitions for uh, globals and module loading implementation, and then run the code in that isolation. Uh, there's also lockdown, uh, which you can use totally separately. It's going to block all prototype pollution and stuff. Uh, and then there's Harden that lets you do the same thing that Lockdown does to the JavaScript environment, but to your own objects. Um, okay, so uh, this, is, this is one of my favorite slides. Uh, do you know Conway's law? Conway's law says that an organization is going to ship its communication structure as software. And this happened to JavaScript. So there's ECMA that defines the language itself, and then there's W3C and uh, Node.js people. They define the powerful APIs. So the language itself doesn't contain any powerful APIs, and Conway's law says if there's separate organizations, the separation is going to be strong, and it is. So any powerful API is only reachable through scope. If you go reach for a global, that's your fetch. There's no way to make an HTTP request built into JavaScript itself. We can have working JavaScript without network access whatsoever. Uh, that's the good separation, and hardened JavaScript leverages that separation. Okay, that was a lot. <laughs> so to sum up, uh, we have install time protections with allow scripts. This is something you can roll out to your application in 10 minutes and be 90% safer. Um, we have runtime protections with lava mode and policy. Uh, that's a bit less trivial to introduce, uh, but I'm willing to support you with that. We want feedback. Um, and then we have hardened JavaScript and CES, which you can use directly for your very specific use cases. Okay, so lava mode is protecting the installation, the build time, and the runtime of the crypto wallet called MetaMask uh, with 30 million users. Uh, and that's been going on for like two years. So, what are you waiting for? Uh, okay, okay. Uh, news, there's also a bundler. So, uh, for MetaMask, MetaMask was originally bundled by Browserify, uh, so it was the easiest to integrate also. Uh, so, we have full support for Browserify. I know most of you don't find it interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna skip the history lessons, uh, but, uh, we finally figured out another integration we can do. It's a Webpack plugin, so if you're using Webpack, uh, you can try out our beta. Uh, we're looking for reports on what breaks. Uh, it's not fully production ready, uh, but do try it out if you dare and see how it works. Speaking of seeing how it works, um, do I have the time to show you something? No. Ah, uh, that's too bad. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. How many minutes? Three. Three. Oh, awesome, yeah. Okay, so look, this is an app. This app is using an external package called Cookie Monster, okay? And you get a random quote from a Cookie Monster, and then uh, you get a reaction from a TypeScript implementation. What's the TypeScript? Well, uh, we needed strong typing for this, all right? Um, yeah, that's, that's TypeScript for you. Uh, okay, I, I just wanted to prove that uh, bundling works. So, uh, I have this setup. Uh, this is the old internal code name for our Webpack plugin, by the way. Uh, ignore that. Uh, 
uh, yeah, this, this demo is kind of old. Uh, this stuff works better now. So I have a Webpack config with just a plugin added, okay? And here in the browser, um, yeah, I have two versions. This one was bundled without the lava mode plugin, okay? So if I run the application, I'm uh, getting some diagnostics that are printed out. I'm getting the quote from Cookie Monster and the response from TypeScript. Uh, and also, Cookie Monster happens to be implemented like this. Not only does it return the random quote, it also uh, grabs your cookies and sends them to his server. Okay? What did you expect? It, it's, it's the Cookie Monster. Um, okay, so. Uh, we're getting a request here in the network tab that says name equals chocolate chip because this is what we set as our cookies. Not cool. Okay, what happens if we uh, build that with LavaMo plugin? Uh, yeah, so same thing happened. Random quote from the cookie monster and then undefined instead of the actual cookie content. Okay? Well, wow. okay. thank you. Zvishek, very powerful and energetic presentation, as promised, and with cookies. With cookies. I said as there was going to be cookies. I'm really, really impressed, and you made me a little bit more, uh, let's say, nervous about the security of everything and how safe we really have to be, uh, or think about, at least attempt to be. You have a question, sir? Yeah. Uh, two quick questions. One, uh, about the... Uh, two quick <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll pick, I'll pick on the one. Uh, have you thought that the, um, the script checking and such capab capabilities of Lava Mode could be implemented as a part of NPM or like any other package manager so it would, would be possible in package.json? Do you think it's a good idea or not, or it should be kept separate? Uh, it's a very big topic. Thank you for the question. Uh, so um, NPM is allergic to breaking changes. So uh, they got the proposal to disable scripts by default. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to lie to you, but like uh, eight years ago, for the first time, maybe. Yeah, that didn't fly. Um, so. We're not gonna get a breaking change anytime soon, uh, and blocking all scripts is also not a good option. So allow scripts is the simplest way we could find, because we didn't want to write it, we just wanted to be protected. Uh, so <laughs> allow scripts is the simplest option we found to protect against uh, malicious post-install scripts. Right, yep, I have it, oh, Okay. <laughs> So basically, your the lava mode uh, is it lava mode? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, lava mode is kind of a glorified polyfill for the proposal. <laughs> uh, well, lava mode is built on top of a glorified uh, okay. polyfill. So CES okay. is the polyfill. The question, the question that I had is more of a curiosity: Is anyone from lava mode? Are you involved in the championship of the TC39? Um, so lava mode people uh, are building a useful and fairly simple to use interface on top of SAS, which is uh, the actual shim that is being presented to TC39 as uh, the example, uh, one of the example implementations of hardened JavaScript. So uh, Lava Mode is here to stay. SAS is going to be consumed into the language, uh, like 80% of it, 90% of it will go away. Uh, because it's going to become part of uh, the engine itself, uh, eventually. Okay, here. Um, to use allow scripts, you have to install first, and you have some devs on that. Do you trust them? Uh, we review them, uh, and there's not a lot of them. Uh, so yes, uh, you need to like you, you need to start from a position of trust, but. Uh, we're also working on improving the developer experience, so eventually we're going to have a tool 
uh, that lets you uh, install allow scripts before you install anything in your uh, project. So currently, you could try doing that if you uh, globally install allow scripts and then run it locally, uh, like a you know the terminal uh, command, and that's going to work. Uh, and so you don't get to accidentally install all of your other dependencies when you're introducing it to the project. Uh, but the overall assumption is we're starting from a point where we felt somewhat secure. So we're assuming today everything is secure. We want to protect ourselves from a future package takeover or any sort of uh, maliciousness showing up in the dependencies. Um. I don't really use Dino, but if I understand it correctly, it has a similar thing to this uh, runtime policies, except it's on a per process level rather than a per dependency. Uh, so the question is, uh, is Slava mode a strict superset of the functionality of Dino's uh, uh, policies or? Um, nope, uh, Lava mode policy is older. Uh, than Dino, so it had no chance of being inspired by Dino uh, and being a subset. Uh, it's a different kind of policy, and we have a bunch of ideas on how to simplify it, etc. So uh, it's going to uh, develop independently, uh, and yeah, it's it's per compartment, and Lava Mode is applying compartments per dependency in your dependency tree. So. Uh, different granularity than Dino. If we had time, I have like a few slides about that topic, but yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to do uh, that. I, I have a question because you showed that for each package, I can configure uh, the APIs that it can use yep. uh, to limit its uh, capabilities. So uh, let's say your average uh, JavaScript project has, I don't know, maybe 10,000, maybe 100,000 dependencies. Mm -hmm. So do I have to specify all of those manually, or do you have some automation for that? Uh, or? Yeah, that policy generation is the automation you're talking about. So uh, Lava Mode protections are based on SAS, which is not parsing the JavaScript at all. It's uh, implementing the protections at runtime in the language. But Lava Mode has a feature to read all your code and generate the policy and then you only specify the overrides file. It was somewhere here. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Policy override is where humans put stuff, and policy JSON is the one that's generated. So every time you update your dependencies, you regenerate this file. Uh, look on the diff. If the diff doesn't say uh, child process or something scary like that, uh, it's okay. You can uh, run it. Uh, and your overrides are elsewhere. And you can make the policy stricter with your overrides. Uh, you can expand it to allow for stuff that we didn't notice uh, is actually needed. Uh, yeah. I think Zbyshek. I have to finish. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, really. Zbyshek <laughs> will, not, will not be leaving immediately, so... Give him a big hand, because as usual, extremely informative, extremely important topic, and uh, lots of questions uh, con connected with uh, your presentation today. Uh, wow, thank you very much. Uh, next, I would like to invite to the stage our illustrious founder, Mr. Piotr Gentara. He has a couple of events that I think he wants to announce and promote. Is that correct, sir? Uh, thank you, Barry, for announcing me. Uh, let's uh, see if my... Yeah, you can see my slide. So, uh, listen, so um, I, I just wanted to say that uh, building uh, such a community is not an accident. It's usually a result of uh, great corporations with uh, also other very powerful communities. And uh, one of these communities uh, that we were cooperating uh, since a very long time and to uh, absolutely uh, programming and JavaScript and open source heroes that we were cooperating with uh, were uh, Michał Mistrzyszyn and uh, Jakub Neander. Can I, uh, can I please ask you here, guys? <laughs> Yes. 
Thanks, uh, Piotr, for the kind words. Welcome, everyone. We're just here for a quick uh, heads up about the conference we are organizing. So a little, know, a little fact about me, I was organizing conferences like for the 15 years, and then I stopped. And in 2007, I organized this conference, which was one of the first in Poland about, and in Europe, by the way, about Ruby and Python. And they were saying, Ruby, Python, like very slow languages, no one will use them, right? And they were right, it seems. So uh, I needed to change, my, change gears a little bit. And today, uh, with Michal, we decided that for the 2024, we'll be organizing a new conference about Next.js and uh, things related to, uh, to modern frameworks, I would say. Yeah, so the idea is to mix uh, different things. And the, more important, the most important uh, thing about this conference is that we are accepting talks. So if you are interested, we are especially looking for minority speakers. If you have something to say about either Next.js, uh, rem Remix, <laughs> Angular, React.js, TypeScript, or, or Quick, uh, you're welcome to submit your uh, proposal and we'll be happy to, to have you. Yeah, so that's the update. Thank you very much. And uh, back to you, Piotr. Yeah, so you, you, might, you might know uh, Michal from uh, Type of Web. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, his effort, his community. And uh, Jakub Neander was actually creating a very uh, an excellent, also uh, monolith uh, platform, uh, Hunsfot, to build uh, a lot of uh, uh, to, to build uh, applications uh, as, as a monolith. Uh, so uh, let's let's ju just jump to our uh, lightning talks uh, today. We have a very special, uh, not only uh, you, but uh, exceptionally, are you fr uh, fr from from New York? There is also <laughs> there is also Paolo, no, <laughs> Paolo. <okay>. Yeah, really. <laughs> also, you you should introduce Paolo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, or you would like to? Okay, yeah. Okay, so our first lightning talk speaker. Our first lightning talk speaker is Paolo Fragomeni. So sometimes, uh, sometimes you create uh, something exceptional in open source that gets over 1,000 stars and starts to be uh, so good. I, I love you juggling. Okay, you, you're here. I love you juggling these tools around this. It's, it's like I, it's just really it's like a giant toddler in a toy store. I love it. Uh, Paolo, generally uh, welcome from New York. By the way, I'm also from New York. It's a pleasure. Uh, you will have five minutes for this presentation. Are you ready, sir? From the time you begin, uh, do you need my microphone? Uh, no. All right. How about now? Hey. Okay. Cool. Uh, so somebody did a talk about cross-platform, and that was really cool uh, because uh, we have built a new runtime for cross-platform that does a lot of the things that the gentleman was talking about. So uh, let's dive right into it. So uh, one code base, obviously. Um, you know, runs on every platform. Our runtime supports iOS, macOS, Android, Windows, Linux, Xbox, the web, and a bunch of other things actually like Android TV, stuff like that. Okay, um, so yeah, any front end library. So there was just a conference announced that was very cool sounding. Uh, there was about eight, 10 different things that were showcased on that front page. Next.js, React. Everybody here has their favorite framework that they want to use, right? And so we support anything that runs on the web. So it doesn't matter what uh, language, you know, what, uh, sorry, what, what framework you want to use, it supports it. And that's super important because this is always changing, right? Um, so yeah, bring your own favorite front end library. Um, and it also supports these really interesting things that browsers can't do, um, like an actual file system that's backed by uh, a cross-platform, well, actually, that's backed by LibUV. Um, so we have a single dependency. And with that, we're able to provide you all of these really interesting things, just like Node. Um, and, and the reason why we did that was because everybody knows how Node works. Uh, the underlying implementation is slightly different and more efficient, but it is ready for you to just sink your teeth into and start being productive. Um, so. Uh, you know, why another runtime? Well, you know, Electron, uh, desktop only, it's ancient, it's also, you know, uh, aging. Um, maintaining that code base is very difficult, um, as any other contributor will, will say. Uh, you know, Flutter, 
you got to learn this thing called Dart. Um, you know, Tori, you got to learn a thing called Rust. Uh, this is just a non-starter for the majority demographic of web developers. And React Native, um, well, you don't have any of the browser APIs. And Cordova, um, if anybody remembers that, it's, um, I don't know, about 15 years old or something. Uh, it's been sort of surpassed by a capacitor, which is Cordova. Um, this is a, also an aging code base and fairly difficult to maintain. And the big problem with all of these things is that these, um, these, these runtimes don't create a boundary between the developer code and the user's operating system, and Socket does. So what we do is we, instead of, um, so you know, if you've seen something like Tori or if you've used something like Electron, what happens is it just runs on your computer. There's no sandboxing between the process that runs and the access it has to do whatever it wants on your computer. Uh, with Socket, all of the developer code is actually sandboxed, and it's, it runs inside uh, a, a, um, a sort of protected area where it's not able to do anything that you don't whitelist with a CSP. So that's the reason why we did that. Okay, so <clears throat> yeah, build native apps for desktop and mobile using your favorite technology that you already know. Okay, so that's, so that's the, the pitch for this thing. Okay, so what I'd like to do is, yeah, sure. Uh, I'd like to live code something. Okay, yeah, sure. sure. Let's see if I can. Hello? Can, can everybody hear me? Okay, cool. All right, let's see if I can get some of, this, some of these windows onto the other screen. Almost. Okay, well first we've got to get rid of this one. Uh, where are we? Okay. Okay. Okay, so far so good. Okay. Let's move this over here. Okay, cool. We have a terminal. Okay. So, um, here, let's see. Uh, here we've got a blank terminal. Okay. Where are we? We're in a directory. Okay. Uh, the way that you install this new runtime is uh, by going to our uh, website, and um, uh, it's a single npm install, or it's a curl, um, and you can just go to uh, socketsupply.co, just like this, and you can see right there, uh, npm install, or curl, or iwr if you're a Windows user, I don't even know how that works. Um, but, uh, okay, so cool. So after I install it, I can do something like, oops. I can do something like this. It creates a little bit of boilerplate, just a little bit. So if I open up an editor um, and look at what it created, uh, that's it. Just some CSS, a little bit of HTML, and that's all. Okay, so I'm gonna run this. Um, here we go. Okay, cool. Um, it's saying, Cool, do you want to do that? Okay, cool, we have a native app. We just built it. Um, the upside from this is that if you look at the build artifacts that were created, oops. Um, okay, so here's the binary. Oops, we want to do something like make this human readable. Okay, this is a 1.5 megabyte binary. So if you compare this to Electron, Electron is a 200 megabyte binary. And that's just the baseline for getting started, right? So this binary is absolutely tiny. So you can ship the super small uh, applications using Socket. And the way that's possible is because it's using a component that's in the OS called the WebView. And so WebView, it ships with every major operating system these days. And some people might tell you, oh, the WebView is uh, inconsistent across operating systems. Well, we fixed that. Uh, so we normalized the WebView across all of these operating systems so that it's the exact same experience for every developer who uses it and creates a UI. Okay, so, um, so that's kind of like um, an example of uh, generating some code. So here's another one where I just did init. Uh, it created some stuff here. And so what I did was, I, uh, to save some time here, uh, I just wrote something while I was sitting over there, which is, um, you know, I created a script tag inside my document, right? Import dgram. Does anybody, has anybody heard of UDP before? Ah, we got some network engineers in the house. Okay, so cool. So, uh, you know, we support all these networking primitives and things like this, just like Node, and, um, you know, we support a buffer, too. And um, so what I do here is, this is pretty simple. Uh, I create a dgram socket. 
inside this page. Wild. OK, so uh, when there is a message on the socket, uh, I create an element. And then um, I uh, take the data, and I assign it to that element, and then I append it to the body. And then I take the socket, and I bind it to a port. OK, cool. So that's, that's what's happening in this code. So let's run this. OK. All right. And uh, so now, now we have this thing running. And here it is. OK. And I'm just going to move this guy over. I'm going to move this guy over a little bit, too. OK. And then down here, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run a program called Netcat. And uh, I'm going to talk to this computer on port 4000. OK, and I'm just going to put some stuff in there. And boom, we see it over here in this UI. Uh, they're talking back and forth. Now, what this sh demonstrates to you is that uh, an old school networking tool like Netcat, which is on everybody's computer, uh, is going to have to have the correct, uh, you know, um, it's, it's going to have to have the correct implementation to be able to talk uh, over this UDP protocol uh, to this application. And so um, this application is capable of most of the same things at Node.js. Um, you've, you've probably used Node or Bun or Dino. Um, you know, these runtimes, they're for building server applications. Socket is for building client-side applications. The browser is no longer the only runtime on the client side. And Socket is here to replace React Native, Electron, and all of these things so web developers can build software using the web stack, using all of their favorite libraries, all of their favorite tools, and it will just work, and it will work safely because it's using web, uh, all of the standard web security technology. So that's it. Don't go anywhere, wait, Paolo, Paolo, Paolo. <laughs> uh, Does anyone have any questions for Paolo about Socket? Client side, yes, of course, sir. You have a question, and it's probably a good one too. Uh, what kind of web view do you use on Linux? Qt web view? Uh, so the web WebKit uh, um, GDK um, is uh, a shared library, and we link to it, and then um, compile that in at compile time. And so it's the same experience across all the OSs. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I hope that our audience online heard that question and understood the answer. Uh, if you're a speaker, please remember to, number one, separate your words, and secondly, speak clearly, because we also have an audience out there in the world at large. Um, thanks for the speech. It sounds like this tool is amazing. I was wondering, are there, are there any limitations of this thing at all? Thanks. Well, obviously, so the question is, are there any limitations to this thing and what it can't do? Well, I mean, you know, the reason why we created it was for web developers to be able to do what web developers do best, right? So the limitations are, um, you know, what, what, you know, sorry, okay. So the question was, is what are the limitations of this? Well, um, you know, it can do anything that a browser can do, um, and it can do more than that. But, uh, you know, there are certain things that it doesn't do yet that it can't do yet, uh, things that we'd like it to do. And those things are, some of them are on our roadmap, so you can check out our roadmap and see what that looks like. We're totally open to taking um, suggestions for features, improvements. You know, we're working on, um, you know, providing an API for GPU. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're really excited about being able to load, uh, you know, AI into it and be able to run that locally. Um, and that's a big thing that we're working on right now because we've just shipped a feature uh, quite recently, peer-to-peer, -peer, which allows developers to be able to create these web apps and then connect them. And so that is a protocol that works over UDP. Um, you know, so it does really different stuff than a browser does. Uh, it does things that browsers may never do, or aren't able to do, because getting buy-in from all the vendors would be too difficult. Um, if that, I don't know if that answers your question. but. Thank you very much. Paolo Fragomeni, all the way from New York to make this presentation lightning talk. Thank you, sir, very, very much. We appreciate it.
Yes, and it is a quite inclusive community we have here. Very happy to be with you all. Some of you are people who are here for the first time. Please don't be shy. If you have a question, there are no dumb questions. Uh, we welcome you and really encourage you to participate in the conversation. If you want to hear dumb questions, ask me to ask a question because Believe me, I have a million questions that probably would be very, the answers would be very obvious to you all. However, I'm curious and I'm involved and I will ask. Okay, uh, our next lightning talk speaker is Marcin Kraszewski. Uh, Marcin, where are you? Oh, there you are. Welcome him to the stage, everyone. Give him a big round of applause. Energy, energy. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, once again, please remember to visit our website, warsawjs.com. Also, our YouTube channel has all of the older, or rather previous talks, and you can catch up on a lot of topics, just check us out. And there's a huge repository there of information for everyone. Look out for Radio IT, it's coming next week. We are back and better than ever. We've upgraded our technology, meaning our production quality, thanks to the inclusion and support of BEC Poland. And we're gonna bring you some stuff that'll be quite interesting and plus music for you to listen to while you are coding. So we got some really interesting stuff there, hoping you will come and visit us either on Facebook or on any other social media platform. I think we're pretty much everywhere. So especially the YouTube channel where you can see the video as well. Are you guys ready? Almost. Marcin Kraszewski, you look awfully familiar. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Maybe awfully was the wrong word. You look very familiar. Uh, I think you, this is not your first meetup, is that correct? No. The first time I'm seeing you actually make an, a lightning talk, though, I'm really excited. Are you ready, sir? Yeah. yeah. Once more, okay. Marcin Kroszewski. Welcome. All right, thank you. All right, everybody, I hope you're ready for a talk that is not going to have any actual code in it. It's a talk that is hand-drawn using colored pencils I purchased just before today. I'm not saying I prepared today. I was prepared earlier, but I really wanted to give you that, that gritty feel, that sort of hand-drawn experience, because everything's so high-tech now. We've got chat GPT, AI is generating stuff for us. Uh, it's, it's making us lazy. We don't even know how to use our hands anymore, right? So uh, I wanted to draw this presentation. And today, uh, I'm Marcin Kraszewski, by the way. You can uh, catch me on Twitter at S-O-A-I World. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about a different way, perhaps, that I want to come up with. I want to invent a way to look at tabular data. OK. Uh, so this thing is called Petri dish, purposely misspelled. Uh, so the idea is visual, visualize tabular data as a biologist, sort of. I'm not a biologist. I didn't even really do a lot of uh, scientific research for this. I just had an idea. The main idea of this talk, behind this talk, is perhaps you've heard of a library that already does this. Great, let me know. Perhaps you heard of multiple libraries that do this, or you, you heard of some other thing that's just like this. Let me know. So really, this is almost like a reverse Google search. I'm just asking for your advice at the end in the form of a question. Questions only today, just like the improv game. OK, so you have your tabular data here. This is a data table in what I call Pencil Excel. And you got your, uh, you got your columns. Uh, you got your headers there. You got all your data there. You know, if you're, if you're working at a bank, I work at a bank. Uh, we just have to look at numbers all day, just numbers, numbers all the time. It just gets really boring. So one of these days, I, I was at the bank, and I just thought, what if we could do something, I don't know, something creative after hours with all these numbers that we have. So um, as you can see, the first row here of numbers, you got 3, 9, 2, 6, 2, 1, et cetera. Uh, those are going to be mapping to different features of this uh, protozoa biological entity creature. Um, obviously, I'd have to develop the logic and all this. There's a lot of effort here. You've got these creatures based on rows in your table. Uh, you can have lots of creatures. They're floating around. Everything's great. They're, they're sort of doing something. We don't know what's happening yet. Uh, the environment would be, again, this is something else I'd have to write, but the environment would be generated based on some statistical analysis of the data, kind of generalizing it. But So the data both creates the uh, entities that are each row and the environment itself. Okay, so then you've got the environment. You've got one of our little entities interacting in the environment. Uh, and then what really gets interesting is when you put them all together and a bunch of stuff happens, and I don't know what will happen when we put in like a million of these things together. Um, currently, the, the idea is very simple, and right now it's just going to be like a 2D physics simulation 
with some behavior that these entities have, and it'll just kind of, it'll run, you'll watch it as an analyst and be like, this tells me nothing, it's completely random. Uh, that's the idea. If you have any ideas that you'd like to shut this down or make it better or whatever, let me know. Uh, this is the time for questions. Yeah. Sir, yeah, I don't know who's, they're completely, everybody's taking a break right now. There's no microphone or anything that I can give you even uh, for, for your question. I'm too fast, I guess. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I go? go. Okay. Oh, Question. sorry. Okay. Question: Is this yeah. like game of life? Like the? Yes. Yes. Exactly. Um, I wanted to somehow do like agent-based simulation, something like that, but where the agent is designed based on some simple tabular row. Does that make sense? Everyone's taking a break. Did I hear that? Ah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> For me, this reminded me of a video game called Spore, and the, it, it was like five different stages of evolution of like some organism. And the first one is similar to that. You are simply a cell swimming in the uh, soup and eating. Like you can be herbivore or carnivore, depending on your choice. So, did, yeah. Question? I know, but. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know that's one. not a question. You have one. No. <laughs> I'm sorry, but like the previous okay. guy said. No, it's, it's quite all right. This reminded you of that game, and that's perfectly all right. No, no, it, it is. It is exactly it like is that, except fine. imagine if it's fed a million rows of real people's transactions. I think that'll be interesting to watch. Yeah. You go ahead in the back. Questions? There. Yeah, right there, there's a question. Okay, I just, you know, forgive me. I'm like 150 years old, so. It's okay. If I don't move as fast as you would like, Swimming please helps. forgive me, okay? Swimming helps. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's not going to be a question you're expecting, I yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was wondering, so what is this exactly? Because I didn't understand. So it's basically, you have a lot of uh, numbers in the tables, and you yeah. visualize it to make it easier to analyze. Is this what it's doing? No, no, okay, so I want to take each row in the table, and that will be the design blueprint for your organism, okay? Every row. So you have a million rows, you have a million organisms. The environment is also designed based on the numbers in the table, and you just run it as a simulation, basically. Does that make sense? That makes no sense. I know, it's, it's crazy. Sure, okay. So the idea would be that you would have little GUI controls that you could kind of spin around, turn around, and see what happens when one column it's used to define a different part of the organism structure. So like you shift it around, you go, okay, wait a minute, this column is really kind of interesting. It's, it's totally changing the behavior of these things. And that column turns out to be, I don't know, person is based in Saudi Arabia, for example. Okay, and they happen to be working in the, the shipping industry and they have, I don't know, the cousin is a titanium parts dealer or something. I don't know, I don't know what it is, but the point is you can have these, these dials, these knobs that very quickly dynamically change what's going on in the simulation to just get a feel for maybe what's going on with the data, maybe not. It's, just, it's like completely unstructured looking at data, playing with it and... A different way to look perhaps, at the numbers. Perhaps completely useless uh, approach. A different way to look at the numbers, basically yes, speaking. Yes, is that what you're yes. saying? You have Especially a question, when sir? You're bored at work. We have one more question for you. Okay, so um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it appears that you're decrypting the data with bacteria. Encrypt Sorry? You're encrypting the data. Okay. So it looks like a bac petri dish. Uh huh. Can you decrypt it to be the same? data as input as output well you could because the so the entities the little creatures whatever you want to call them uh their structure doesn't evolve or change over time it's just the interaction that we're looking at uh which is again crazy because the 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 rows are supposed to be independent data so yeah of course it's totally insane i just wanted to bring it out here no, um, hold on but the question was can it be actually decrypted and you would see the yes same? because i mean uh, I mean, theoretically, yeah, if you knew, if you knew how the blueprint is, is, is being created from what it's pulling to uh, create that, the wall thickness and the different flagella and all that stuff. You know, I love one thing. I love innovation, and I love uh, people who are looking to find creative ways to express uh, data and also to analyze data. This is what this is all about. I think this is why we come, to find a, a way to stretch our imagination. This is a very interesting thing you've just done. This is, uh, this is early, early stage. Because I myself cannot find a practical use for it as much as I struggle 
in my, let's say, my meager imagination. Yeah. However, yeah. I can see here that there's some potential for some sort of a visualization tool. Uh, maybe, I don't know, an ID. I don't know what to we call it. We don't know. It. Just wait for the first uh, code that I write that isn't, for the first iteration. isn't completely useless. Yeah. Looking forward to that. Yes, yes. Marching. I'll publish it. I'll send it. I'll send you a link. Please do. And by the way, don't forget, folks, to visit us on our Slack channel. Uh, we really would appreciate it. Warsaw.js is looking for your participation. Marcin, thank you thank very, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bad. Switch, switch. All right. So before we go, uh, does anyone have any other question about any of the presentations that were made here tonight that can be answered on site? Any other, any other questions that were left unanswered? Yes, of course you do. What, why be sorry? I think it, you know, every, every question contributes. Maybe you'll say something that will expand someone's uh, imagination. Um, this question is to Lava Mode presenter. I'm sorry, I don't know where you're at. But um, sure, thanks. Um, I was wondering, were there any real cases of people losing money on NPM packages, so on these attacks? Because I'm thinking of the way how to pitch it to our, let's say, product managers to in, like include it in our sprint and implement it actually. But if uh, I'm wondering if there were cases of you know these attacks and stuff. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so so I'm gonna give you the story I skipped for time, uh, but uh, yeah, a friend of mine who started MetaMask, uh, Aaron, uh, he one day woke up and read the news. Uh, saying an NPM package was taken over and it stole private keys from people's crypto wallets. And he was sure this was about MetaMask. And for, uh, like, luckily it wasn't, it was a different uh, wallet, but that day he decided to stop working on the features and start working on Lava Mode. Uh, and this thing actually stole people's money uh, and it was very sophisticated, so the guy took over a package by asking a famous maintainer to take over and start working on a package and maintain it. He put an encrypted payload in it that would only correctly decrypt if it's a dependency of a specific package that was used by this specific wallet, so anyone else could not figure out what it is, and it stole people's money. Uh, you can you can Google for news, malicious NPM packages. There's a lot of examples of stuff being stolen. Wow. Very encouraging. Was that a, an answer to your question? Especially for me, who unfortunately lost the 12-word key to my uh, MetaMask wallet and have not been able to either create another account or uh, reinstall it or remember or recall. You know, it's it's a mess for me. So... Interesting information. Probably someone has stolen it, and they're outspending my money right now. Uh, folks, on the screen here, we have a QR code that we would love it if you would scan. This is uh, what we're asking you to do is fill out our survey. We have a lot of questions for you about what we do here, how you think we might be able to do it better, and we really, really appreciate your, would appreciate your filling it out and giving us your feedback. It really will help us a great deal. In addition, do these move? And these do not move. Can you move the slides? Ah, I'm trying to get my clicker to engage. Uh, also, we do have an announcement about a discount for our next uh, Warsaw JS Meetup, which will be happening in about a month. Warsaw JS Meetup number 111. And you can be almost sure that I'll be there because, as you know, three is my favorite number. And so, oh, this is the survey again. And this is the Warsaw JS Discount, yes. You have something to say. Uh, all right, so uh, we, we just started to uh, have uh, stickers for the next meetup, but uh, meanwhile, there is, hello. Hello. There is, uh, there are some special words uh, from our marketing director, Ahmad Pirahi, to say in this uh, special time that we are experiencing now special time that we're having now. I just have a feeling that this is going to be a crisis time. Guys, just to be clear, this is uh, 9 o'clock. Uh, have you ever been to Slush, any of you guys, by any chance? Like, when you go there, uh, it's in December in the coldest 
place ever, you don't call it in Poland. So when you go there, you literally see this banner that nobody in the right mind go to Helsinki in December. Welcome to Slash. So it's late in the night and all of you are here because you want to add something to yourself. So it's interesting for me. Like this is, this just shows that how much you're dedicating to what you're trying to do. You can just go out drinking with friends. You can be in the party, but you're here. So I really appreciate it. But just one thing that I want to have here is, as Barry also mentioned, we're a community. So thank you very much for coming to the event. But remember that you can carry us with yourself everywhere you go. If you are joining us on our social media, start a dialogue with us. Ask us the question that you have right now to the people, but then later you can come to our social media and follow up with that. Join the Slack channel, put your question there. If there is a point that Barry said that this is not a question, you cannot have that, you have less control on Slack. So you would be able to really just be on your side and do whatever you want to do there. So I want you to really try to help us to take the event part out and literally put it as a community. So wherever you go, you can carry this Warsaw.js with yourself. And if there is any way you would feel that this is going to add value to you, or you think that the event can somehow be better, we're going to have a new year, we're going to have a new time. And as you can see also some of the slides here are just showing us a little bit of a difference. So we're going to have these 2024 vibes on the side, right? If there was anything, feel free to contact us. We have the survey. We're pretty much out in the public, and we would like to hear more from you. So with that, I will say thank you very much for the team that worked for one year to entertain you. If we can just give them a round of applause. Uh, is it possible that we can have the volunteers and anybody that is here just to come on stage? Because you're always sitting in the back. Mehdi, I'm just seeing some of you here. So don't pretend that you don't know me. And Louisa, I just saw that you went behind the wall. So <laughs> come on. OK. Guys, we are very much having people that they don't want to have publicity, I think. I, no, I don't want to put you on the spot. Come on. Yes. Sasha, I think if you don't come over, nobody would like to. <laughs> OK, we only have one person who want to be on the stage. Yes, please. <laughs> Guys, you're doing all the good job, but at least you know, like, try to make sure people understand that event does, doesn't happen by itself, you see? Yes. And for some of you that you are not trying to come, you can come over. Sure. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, Mattel left a little bit early, and I think we have the rest. We also have a very interesting team member that unfortunately he is at home, so we're just going to virtually just say hi to him wherever the camera is. Yeah, just please come, yes. Yeah, so yes. So these are the guys that makes the magic happen. Buddy, I think you, you're just missing the point is you're also a part of the team, so. Come on, of course. No, there is no just. <laughs> yes. Good. So guys, remember, being a volunteer and being a part of this is not an exclusive part. If you are really feeling that you can contribute either on this side or that side, feel free to reach out and then you would be able to be a part of this team. With that, I just want to say thank you very much for being here. Thank you for the BEC for giving us the location and those amazing food. And we would like to see you soon on January. Thank you. And thank you, yes, to our online audience. So hopefully you can also come over and uh, hopefully try to see us uh, you know, in a stage. And we also have to see if they will be able to get their questions and answers somehow so that they will be able to be heard a little bit more. So even though we're not literally hearing you, but we will try to make sure that virtually we will be able to make your presence a bit more visible. Thank you very much again. Uh, th there's, there's one more, uh, one more word from me about uh, the uh, next registration process. So uh, when you buy the ticket uh, for the next you, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So when you when when you buy the ticket for the next Warsaw JS, expect an email with further uh, instructions how to proceed with the registration because the next registration will be more complicated. There will be one more step that you need to do so that uh, you, you 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 can get the pass to the next uh, uh, place. The next place uh, will be at uh, Kasprakas uh, Street at Snowflake. I think I I have the. 
website open something yeah our our new venue sponsor for the next meeting is uh, snowflake and uh, we're going to have the next uh, meetup there have i have i done it well sasha anything more about about this case yeah okay so so you will get an email expect an email after after the registration there all right the discount is 50 percent you can okay all right i i will show you i will show you. I, maybe you can buy even now meetups uh 100 oh no uh, it's too to uh, january get tickets yeah so now now it's now it's uh, only 30 36 so that's that's something like you know even even not nine euro right okay uh, so yeah so thank you very much i think that's all for today ahmad would you like to say something else something more so again thank you bc thank you for thank you fresha and thank you xfang thank you <laughs>